Okay, so now let's talk about visualizing data. Um, we'll start with visualizing amounts, which is a very common way of visualizing stuff. Amounts are just counts of things. Um, and one of the most common ways to visualize amounts is the um, good old fashioned bar chart or bar plot. Um, this, this is one of the default plots that you can get in Excel. It's very easy to make. Um, in R, you just use geom underscore call and it'll make a column chart for you. Um, the reason why these are so great and why they're kind of universally beloved is because um, as humans, we're really good at um, distinguishing differences in lengths of stuff. Um, if we have two different lines that are side by side, we can easily tell the difference between how long they are. So if you look here at this, this chart, this is fake data I just made, it, made up. But if you look here, there is a visible difference between the numbers of prime ministers and the number of presidents. Um, it's only like two or three or four, um, but there is a difference there. If you're looking at something like a pie chart, the way this encodes information isn't with lengths, it's with angles and with um, sizes and areas. And the issue here is that we aren't that great at distinguishing angle sizes. Um, so right here, prime minister and president are different sizes, as we can see here in the bar chart. Um, but there's no way that you can actually tell that when you look at the pie chart um, because the, the visual encoding of that, that difference there is encoded as an angle and as size or as this area, and we can't really tell the difference. So bar charts are great because um, they use length, which we're really good at, at perceiving. So yay bar charts. Um, but they're fairly easy to misuse and abuse um, because... Um, the whole width of, or the whole length of the bar is actually important for conveying information. And so if you cut off any, any part of the bars, it actually distorts the length and distorts the whole meaning of the number. And so there's this screenshot from Fox News a few years ago when they're talking about um, declining Obamacare enrollments and how people weren't signing up for the Affordable Care Act exchanges as fast as um, the administration was hoping they would. And so if you look at this chart, it looks like there's a massive difference between 6 million and 7 million here. Um, that's a big jump. But if you extend this all the way down to zero um, and zoom out, the difference between 6 million and 7 million is actually pretty small. This exaggerates that difference there. Um, and so that's not actually like true. They truncated the, the y-axis and cut off the zero. Um, and so now this line, this distance, if this represents 6 million, this no longer represents 6 million. This, it looks like it's almost three times as large as this. And so if that's 6 million, this would be like 18 million, but it's not, it's only seven. So that's too much of an exaggeration. Um, it's not just Fox News that does this. A couple years later, the Obama administration tweeted this out, um, showing that high school graduation rate has been, it's the highest it's ever been. Um, so here's 2011, this is great, hooray. Um, but if you notice the axis, it starts at 70% instead of at zero. And so again, it looks like from 2008 to 2009 and 2011 to 2012, it looks like it, the rate has doubled. It's because um, it's halfway in the graph here and now it's above kind of this top line here. But that's not a doubling. That's going from 75% to 82%. Um, so going up by seven percentage points, not 50 percentage points. And so truncating um, the y-axis is a bad thing to do. Um, and everybody does it because that's a lot of wasted space if you drew these bars all the way down. Um, and so it makes harder to read graphs. It's also, it's, it's used often to highlight things that shouldn't be highlighted, um, like this right here. Um, yes, they weren't catching up to their goal, but it wasn't, they weren't like three times behind their goal. They were just a little bit behind their goal. Um, but by truncating, you can emphasize that incorrectly. Um, so because the entire line length matters, the length of the line is what is actually encoding the size of the data or the size of the count. Um, you can't truncate it. You always have to start at zero with these bar charts um, or don't use bars. The whole reason for having a bar chart is because the length of the bar encodes the data. So if, if you're worried about the plot taking up too much ink because all of the bars are like in the 90% and you don't want all of that extra junk, do something else like dots or anything that's not those bars. 
um, because those bars are essential to getting the, the length, which then conveys that, that information. So that's kind of the main rule about bar charts here is always start at zero. Um, it's also common to use bar charts and things that shouldn't be um, bar charted. Um, there's this fun Kickstarter campaign from a few years ago. There's a video here. Um, I won't play it here because it'll probably um, freeze and not work well. Um, but follow along with these slides and you can click on this play button and watch the video. Um, you should do that right now. Pause this and watch the video. Unpause and come back to me. And so they have this this hashtag bar bar plots uh, movement. I haven't seen very much activity on this hashtag since like 2016 when they made this thing. Um, and it's a really cheesy video, but it does have good points to it um, where you don't want to take complicated data that's not counts. Like counts are great because it's just a single number. But if you're trying to summarize data with something like a bar chart, you lose a ton of information. So they, they briefly showed this example in their video um, where if you want to see the average weight of a whole bunch of cats and a whole bunch of dogs, this is 100 simulated animals here. It looks like there's no difference in average weight. Um, they're all 40 pounds on average um, because this is showing average weight here. But if we actually look at the data more carefully, um, and instead of using bars, we use a whole bunch of points, we can see that these dots here do show the averages. They're at 40, but the distribution of dogs is fairly normally distributed here around 40. Some are heavier and some are lighter. But the distribution of cats here, um, there are none at 40. There are a whole bunch down at 20 and there are a whole bunch up at 60, um, but nothing here at 40. And this tells a way more complicated version of our story. And um, we can see that there's like three groups of, of animals instead of two. Um, we can see that there is a significant difference between the bigger cats and the dogs and the smaller cats and the dogs and the bigger cats and the smaller cats. We don't get any of that information here with just looking at bar charts. And so we lose a whole bunch of detail. Um, so when you're working with summary statistics like averages or medians, um, you don't ever want to use a bar chart. Even if you stuck like an error bar on here to show the standard DV or the, the confidence interval, um, it would still hide the fact that you have these two different modes within the cat weights. Um, it's going to hide way more information that, than you want it to. Um, so the basic way of fixing this when you're trying to show summary data like averages is to show more data. Um, so for instance, what we have right here, these are called strip plots where they're just a whole bunch of dots that are in these um, two columns, these two categories here. Um, we use position jitter, um, which you're familiar with from other exercises you've done. Um, this just randomly sort, randomly shuffles the dots along the x-axis here, not along the y-axis, because the y-axis actually matters, but along the x-axis, nothing really matters. And if you scroll over, you can see it says height equals zero. That means don't randomly jitter anything up and down, only jitter stuff side to side. Um, so right here with the strip plot, this shows us the actual distribution of all of the data within these two categories, conveys a lot more information that way. You can also do fancy things like add points or lines for the median or for the, for the mean. We did that here with these dots. Um, you can also, instead of having them just kind of scattered around, there's a package called ggbswarm that you can install. If you Google ggbswarm, you'll find the web page for it with a whole bunch of documentation. Um, this is the same idea as a strip plot, but it adds more structure to, um, to the strips here. And so here, rather than just having them shuffled all over, it kind of makes a, a density plot. And so if you look at this, this kind of looks like a normal distribution here, another normal distribution there. You can see the shape of that distribution. And so all the points are kind of forced into a distribution shape, which helps um, again communicate a lot more than just having the bars. And so this, this shows more of the story. You can also combine different geoms. Um, and so here you can combine a strip plot and then overlay a box plot. Um, because some people really love box plots. They show the median, they show the different um, interquartile ranges and the percentiles here. They show outliers. It can kind of get confusing when you do this overlay because outliers are shown as points, um, but then you also have points here. And so that's, that's hard. Um, there is an R package. I can't remember the exact name. I think it's called um, 
gg half box plot or something like that. If you Google half box plot, gg plot, you'll find it. Um, what it lets you do is do a strip plot like this, but it will put the dots on one side and it'll put the histogram on the other side. So they're not actually on top of each other, they're side by side, um, which is potentially more helpful than overlaying them directly like this. Um, you can also use violin plots. Um, instead of box plots, or maybe in addition to box plots, you can add another geom box or yeah geom box plot to this line here, and then you'll have all three. Um, so you can go crazy with this. Um, another popular way of doing this is something called a ridge plot, um, where you can show the distributions of these different um, variables or the different categories, um, and kind of overlay them like this. Um, so the cats is in front, and then dogs is behind it. It's almost like a three D effect. If you have lots of different groups, you can keep kind of stacking them behind each other. Um, that's really useful if you're looking at like a whole bunch of countries, the distribution of like ages or um, um, GDP or any variable across like a whole bunch of different countries. Or um, you can look at variation over time. If you're looking at temperatures in an area um, for the past 10 years, you can have average temperatures going back 10 years and you can see kind of the 3D effect of these density plots moving backwards. Um, so that's pretty cool. It's a package called GG Ridges. If you Google that, you'll find a whole bunch of um, examples in their documentation for how to do this. Um, so you should check that out. So in general, the main rules for doing stuff with, with amounts and with bar charts is if you're using a bar chart, always start at zero. Um, because again, the line length is what is encoding the information. And so you can't truncate that because then you're telling lies. Um, if you have summary statistics, don't use bar charts. Um, even if you stick error bars on there to make it look more statsy, um, you're still gonna lose way too much information. So use other things instead. Um, the end of the bar is often all that really matters um, when you're looking at these line lengths. And so sometimes you don't even need to use bars. If all you care about is the end of that bar, um, you can convert that to a dot and then you can zoom in. Um, instead of truncating all of the information that's in the line. Um, so there's a few examples of this. And so throughout these examples, I'm just using a summarized version of the Gapminder data set that just gets the count of the numbers of countries in different continents in 2007. It's not like it changes much over time. It's just I had to choose a year. Um, other, so in the data set, there's two countries in Oceania. Had I not filtered, then it would show like hundreds of countries in Oceania be, or dozens. Um, because it's just repeating those over time. Um, so this is a standard bar chart. Um, you can see it's sorted by the number of countries. Adding the sort makes it easier to, to follow. You can see that Africa has the most countries. Oceania clearly has the fewest. Um, you can easily tell the difference between Asia, Europe, and Americas. If this was a pie chart, the Oceania slice would be tiny, Africa slice would be huge, and these would look all identical, um, which we don't need. Um, so another alternative, um, is something called a lollipop chart. Um, where here, since the end of the bar is the most important part, you can emphasize it the most and kind of get rid of all of that extra stuff. So this is kind of a waste of ink to have all of that if you're really just showing how long that line is and that it ends here. So the lollipop chart does that. It just uses a single line and then adds a point at the top of the line. Um, you still can't truncate these because the line is still kind of encoding that information. So you don't want to start this at 20 or something like that. Um, the way you do this with uh, ggplot is you use geom point range. So technically what geom point range does is it has um, three different aesthetics that you feed it. You feed it y, which is what the dot is. You feed it y min, which is where the bottom part of the line ends. And you feed it y max, which is where the top part of the line ends. You typically do this if you're showing something like confidence intervals around a point. So you'll have a point and then it goes down to this point and goes up to that point. Um, and we'll do that later when we get to relationships and regressions. Um, you, making coefficient plots for regression models um, with geom point range is actually super easy, super helpful, um, because you can quickly show kind of the confidence intervals around your different regression coefficients. In this, we're kind of cheating a little bit and saying start these lines, start this y min down at zero, so it starts down there and goes up to the point. And then the y max, instead of having it be that value plus some confidence interval, we're just making it be that value. So there is a line going from that dot up to that dot. 
So it's like an invisible zero length line, but that, that's what's happening here, is you have part of this y min is making the line go down, the y max is making the line go to that point or do nothing. And so that's how we get the lollipop chart. Um, if you don't care about the lines at all, you can just do g on point instead. And it will only do the points, it won't draw the lines, and then in that case, you could zoom in. In this case, Oceania is down there. It's forcing the axis down. But if we omitted Oceania, um, then we could go from 20 to 60 legally um, since we're just showing the dots. There's no more lines encoding the information. And so that's one way you can kind of zoom in. Another alternative is something called a waffle chart. And you read about this in your readings before today. Um, here... Um, each of these squares represents one of the values in the data set. So each one of these is a country. It doesn't always have to be a one-to-one -one transformation. These could be um, one box equals five countries, one box equals 200 countries, something like that. Um, but then they're colored by continent. And so this shows um, area, which pie charts are bad because we stink at area and we stink at angles. Um, especially when they're together. But if we just look at area, we're generally okay with area. Um, we can tell that the blue section is bigger than the yellow section. The green and yellow are roughly the same. That's hard to tell the difference, but um, like we do see a difference between the blue and the, and the green here. Um, there's an R package that does this for you. It's called the Waffle Library. It's not in the the fancy CRAN repository of packages. You can't use the install packages command directly in R, and you can't use the packages panel and click on install. Um, if you do, you'll get an older version of it that doesn't have geom waffle in it. And so you have to um, run this line of code right here, this dev tools install GitHub. So the developer has the whole package um, hosted on GitHub, which is a big site that lets you store code. And so you can, install packages directly from GitHub with this command. So once you install it, then you can just use library waffle like normal. Um, the only difference here is it needs one special aesthetic called values. And so that's just the number um, from that, that end column. And so once you add that, it has a whole bunch of different options. Like this is number of rows, uh, which we then flipped. And so had I not done flip equals true, this whole waffle plot would be sideways. Um, and there are nine rows, but then we flipped it, so it's actually nine columns. Um, you can change those numbers. And so that's, that's how you make waffle charts. Um, one other alternative is if you don't really care about the exact counts, like there are tons of, of observations, um, there are huge count numbers, you don't really need to know the exact differences between observations, um, you can do something like a heat map. And we'll do this in the example for today, um, create this exact chart here. Um, but if you look here, there are a whole bunch of tiles here um, for the day of the month and the month of the year. So this is essentially a calendar from January 1st to December 31st. And this shows the average number of births per day on each of these, on each of these tiles here. And the cool thing about this is we don't really care about like, the difference between January 6th and January 7th. But we do care about larger trends. Um, so here we can see that there are far fewer births on January 1st and January 2nd, far fewer births on July 4th and July 5th, and during Christmas and Thanksgiving. Um, that's kind of the least likely time for people to be born because nobody wants to go to the hospital and have a baby those days. The most common days for being born are right here in September. Um, I think the most common day was like um, September 17th or 18th right here. Um, and that, coincidentally, is like nine months after January 1st-ish. And so tons of people are being born um, after being conceived at the very beginning of the year. And so we can see those counts here um, through a heat map rather than um, if, you would, if you could imagine like 365 individual bars, that would be nuts. Um, but we don't have to worry about that because we've kind of condensed it all into this heat map here. Um, so those are a whole bunch of different ways of looking at amounts. Um, and the general rules for working with bar charts and other amount showing graphics.